Okay, so good morning, um, everyone. We are very happy to open this uh, third annual conference of the Digital Chair, Digital Governance and Sovereignty Chair. Uh, and I would like uh, first to thank very warmly all our partners, Soprasteria Next and um, La Caisse des Dépôts for their uh, constant support. So what we are going to discuss today is digital sovereignty and geopolitical crisis. Um, it's, it's probably another uh, perception of the question of digital sovereignty that we will address today. Over the previous conferences, we have discussed a certain uh, perception of digital sovereignty seen as um, um, an expression basically meaning technological independence, uh, strategic autonomy, um, the wish to be more independent from American companies or Chinese companies since we are, we, and we know that we are dependent in the cloud, we are dependent in semiconductors, and, and last year we discussed the question of the sovereign cloud. So today the objective is to focus on a more traditional approach of sovereignty um, that could be defined as, broadly speaking, the, the power of the state, and so we will come back to a certain perception of um, digital sovereignty that means that the states need to exercise its power over the virtual world, over the internet. And this is, I think here in Europe, something that to a certain extent we want, because we want the EU, we want the states, to regulate the digital world, we want the states to regulate those very big tech companies that are so powerful. So, of course, we welcome all those regulations that are being drafted in Brussels. But at the same time, maybe we should realize that there might be abuses when the state wants power, power, power over the network, um, it can control the virtual world, it can control citizen through technology, and this is the reason why we'll be di we will be discussing those aspects today. Later this afternoon, we will have two panels, one uh, on the Russian strategy of digital sovereignty and the other one on the Chinese strategy of a sovereign internet. And so this will be um, 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 the, the occasion to discuss what we will introduce this morning, the question of digital authoritarianism. And this is the reason why uh, we are very, very honored to welcome distinguished speakers to discuss this issue, this issue of digital authoritarianism. So first, I, I should introduce Nate Persily, who will be uh, giving uh, the keynote this morning. Nate Persily is a James B. McClatchy Professor of Law at Stanford Law School. Um, he um, focuses on American election law and the law of democracy. Uh, his current work examines the impact of changing technology on political communications, campaign, and election administration. He is a co-director of the Stanford Cyber Policy Center, the Stanford Program on Democracy on the Internet, and the Stanford MIT Healthy Elections Project. Um, he co-edited the book Social Media and Democracy, and he has helped recently uh, author the Platform Accountability and Transparency Act uh, that already has been introduced in Congress but will be discussed again in a few days, as, as far as I understand. So we are very um, uh, pleased to, to welcome him uh, today. Uh, Sergei Gouriev will uh, discuss uh, um, uh, Nate's um, presentation. Uh, uh, Sergei is now the Sciences Po Provost. He's uh, a professor of economics. He joined Sciences Po um, in 2013 after running the new economic school in Moscow. He has served as the chief economist of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Um, and um, he's also a research fellow and the leader of the research and policy network on populism at the Center for Economic Policy Research. Um, and then uh, we will have with us Arancha Gonzalez, who is uh, the Dean of the Paris School of International Affairs. Um, uh, Ms. Gonzalez served as the Spain's Minister of Foreign Affairs 
Um, she previously was the Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations and the Executive Director of the International Trade Center. And she also served as the Chief of Staff to the Director General of the World Trade Organization, Pascal Lamy. So um, I think that now, Nate, the, the floor is yours, and, and, and we're delighted to hear um, your keynote. Well, thank you very much, Florence, and it's, it's been wonderful over the last year having you at Stanford and uh, building this relationship. I will say that coming here to Sciences Po and talking about digital authoritarianism uh, makes me a little bit nervous, in part because of uh, the provost sitting next to me here, who is probably uh, one of the world's experts, the foremost experts on the question of digital authoritarianism. Uh, his book, Spin Dictators, is, is really a Bible, I think, of, for those who are researching and looking at this area. And so given how nervous I was, I decided uh, also to try to win you over. Uh, I asked the chat pot GPT-3 to write the first few minutes of this lecture in French. One thing you will notice is that I do not speak a word of French. And so I'm hoping I haven't violated any French defamation laws or anything. But I had uh, Florence uh, evaluated for legal compliance. <laughs> and so I asked the, ch the chat bot, uh, GPT-3, which is probably familiar to many of you, I said, please write a speech in French in the style of Nathaniel Persley, discussing the advantages that authoritarian governments have over democracies concerning control over their populations through digital communication technologies and the internet. I put the English uh, 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 to the side. I didn't actually translate it. I just had it do two different, you'll notice the speeches are a little bit different. I will try my best to, to convey this to the throngs on YouTube who are watching this at home. Uh, so I will try and, 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 and please, you know, I, I hope that I know that, you know, that, that coming to Paris, it's always good to try to show, you know, some facility with the French language. I, I hope that this does not backfire on me. Um, so, Madame et Messieurs, je suis Nathaniel Persily. Et je suis, je vous See, this is not going to work. Discuter des avantages que les gouvernements autoritaires ont sur les démocraties en ce qui concerne le contrôle de leurs populations à travers les technologies de communication numérique et l'Internet. Il est indéniable que l'Internet et les technologies de communication numérique ont ouvert uh, de nouvelles opportunities pour les gouvernements autoritaires de contrôler leurs populations, uh, par exemple, <laughs> en utilisant des filtres et des censures de, sur les raisons sociales, les gouvernements autoritaires uh, peuvent contrôler les informations qui, qui circulent sur Internet, ce qui leur permet de réprimer les voix uh, dissidents and de maintenir le, le pouvoir. I'm going to switch to English now just because I think I've mangled, the, I've now mangled the French language enough that I'm afraid I'm going to create a foreign policy crisis. Um, um, but you can see uh, the rest uh, and then just to, to, to go to the, the, the second uh, page, uh, if, if you've read that far. Um, what I found amazing about this is that it kind of got pretty close to what I was going to say here today. Um, and, uh, and so I don't know how many of you, it's only in the last week that this new AI tool has been made available uh, to the public. And its power is really uh, unbelievable. I'm going to talk a little bit about the ability of authoritarian governments to, um, to use AI and how the surveillance state facilitates data collection and surveillance that, that, that can be used in AI models. Um, but I thought this was a, a way to, 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 to start. Uh, again, forgive me if, uh, if I uh, have, have done an injustice to the French language, which I imagine I did. So I want to just start with the basic argument that I'm going to make here today, which is that digital communication technologies are not inherently democratic, that authoritarian governments are uniquely advantaged by digital technologies in their capacity to engage in censorship, surveillance, and propaganda. Now, not all authoritarian governments are created equal. Some authoritarian governments are advantaged under certain circumstances. 
And so the interesting question is what types of authoritarian governments in what types of context can take advantage of digital communication technologies? Now, just to, uh, uh, I wanna, I, I, as I make that argument, I think you're already thinking about certain things. Uh, it's, and so I wanna start with certain caveats. And when I say preemptive, what aboutism, right? Because you, you're thinking, what about uh, certain things? So what about Trump, all right? Democratic governments or democratic leaders with authoritarian tendencies can also engage in digital authoritarian behavior. I want to concede that. Second, what about India, Brazil, Philippines, Singapore, Indonesia? Pick your, your country. Um, yes, authoritarian governments and democratic governments, that is not a binary. They exist along a continuum. And one of the questions is, um, how do democracies also engage in some of these tactics? But what I'm going to argue is that it's inherently more difficult for them to do so. Um, and to maintain themselves as democracy. And the Chinese example, which I'm going to talk uh, quite a bit about, is the exception to the general rule, that what China is able to do is unlike any other country in the world. And, and so that when we think of authoritarian governments, we think, need to think a little bit more uh, than the Chinese example. And then as we look around the world, you see what's happening in China, you see what's happening in Iran right now with respect to uh, protests and, and, and it seems like there's cracks, um, not just in the surveillance state and uh, with respect to the digital, uh, uh, sort of digital authoritarianism, but also in authoritarianism generally. I don't actually think that the story, it's, it's what's, what's happening in those uh, countries is about what's happening in the digital sphere so much as it is that people are willing to go out in the streets and actually protest. But, but maybe that, that we're, we're seeing some cracks. So I just wanted to start with some caveats because I think there are certain things that we bring to this question um, that, that I want to blunt at the outset. And so let me just, just highlight three what I'll call straw man arguments. The first is that the internet is inherently democratic. Um, the second is that if it's not inherently democratic, it's inherently regime threatening, all right? That, that, that all types of regimes of control, no matter what the political system that we're talking about, will, have the, uh, will be undermined by the libertarianism or the almost anarchic tendencies of the internet. And then finally, whether the internet uniquely advantages and enables authoritarian control. And while I'm not going to make that, that third strong argument, I want to at least highlight it about how some authoritarian governments are uniquely advantaged. So let's just start with the, the, a little bit of the history over the last 20 years as we've thought about the relationship of the internet to both authoritarianism uh, and democracy. And so my colleague Larry Diamond at Stanford uh, wrote a piece a while ago in, in um, the Journal of Democracy describing the internet as liberation technology. And that, I think, was the consensus for so many years. If you remember, you know, I believe it was Bill Clinton who described right, Chinese and or authoritarian government's attempt to regulate the internet was like trying to nail jello to a wall. Now, we know that that's not the story that ended up happening. Um, instead, particularly since the 2016 election, we have been concerned about digital technologies and their threat to democracy. And so I've spent a lot of time over the last six, seven years uh, writing about that, um, most principally after the 2016 election, asking the question whether, can, whether democracy uh, can survive the internet. And the basic argument about how digital technology threaten democracy is that there are certain features of the way that we communicate online that themselves undermine democratic governance. And I wanna, I wanna highlight here that the, the important question to ask in, in all of, when you're talking about any of these regimes, is what is it about the technology itself that makes this form of government more difficult um, uh, to be stable and, and to function? And so the question not, is not, I think, for example, whether uh, there's a rise in hate speech or whether there's a rise in fake news. Because hate speech is as old as speech, fake news is as old as news. And the question is, what is it about the technology itself that seems to undermine certain types of government as opposed to others? And so as we think about 
the, the stresses that the digital environment places on democracies, I would highlight these features. So the first is a family of features, velocity, virality, and volume, the speed at which information travels, the fact that it's done through peer-to-peer -peer, uh, transfer of information, and the sheer amount of information that we have in our pockets uh, on our cell phones. So these are democratically relevant phenomena. So the speed at which information travels makes, for example, well-placed lies in the period right before an election have greater uh, capacity to affect democratic decision making. Virality, the taking away of uh, intermediaries, uh, you might think of that as an inherently democratic feature of the internet, right? I mean, it, as we think about it, say, in the United States, it was, there was nothing particularly democratic about the television news that we had in the United States before the internet, where you had three white men in their 50s or 60s deciding what truth was, right, for the population. But we've replaced, we've essentially eliminated all of those intermediaries where virality now becomes the coin of the po political communication realm. And so uh, those types of candidates, those types of strategies, and those types of speech that are able to be transmitted virally are the ones that are privileged in the digital environment. And we know as social scientists that the kind of information and communication that's privileged in that environment are appeals to emotion and outrage. Sometimes it's appeals to love as well. That's why you have so many cat videos in your news feed, right? But uh, a, a communication environment that privileges virality and privileges non-cognitive uh, deliberation and privileges that kind of emotional um, uh, response is not one that is conducive to democratic deliberation and decision making. And the point about volume is that the amount of information that we have necessarily transfers power to private companies who have to end up being uh, the curators of that. And the large companies of Facebook and Google and TikTok and Twitter um, now are in a position such that, as I'll say in a moment, their rules of political communication are often more important than formal law. So you've outsourced essentially a lot of the democratic decision making on rules of speech to these private platforms. Second is the problem of anonymity. And so uh, with anonymity, we get both our hate speech problem and our bot problem, right? And so when it comes to uh, anonymous speech, you're willing to engage in uh, certain kinds of speech online that you wouldn't have otherwise. Now, anonymity, say, in, in the United States constitutional law is actually a protected feature of free speech, right? That you have, if you know the Federalist Papers in the US, they were actually written under a pseudonym of Publius. Um, but we are now quickly approaching a, a world, and I sort of started with that in, in this speech, where you will not be able to distinguish between a human and a machine who is talking to you. And to the degree that democratic deliberation requires, in a sense, deliberation and a meeting of the minds between actual human beings, who are voters, or at least capacity to vote or participate, um, that is undermined in a in a system in which anonymous speakers are uh, able to essentially communicate without uh, restriction. And so while anonymity has always been protected, anonymous speakers have never had the megaphone that they have uh, in today's world. Third is homophily, or the idea of echo chambers and filter bubbles. There's a lot of debate as to whether echo chambers really exist online or who they exist for. Where the research now, I think, points us is that for some, it's not that the average person is descending into an echo chamber, um, but that there's a significant share of people who do. And so particularly as you look at the kind of QAnon sewers on the internet or um, uh, you know, extremist uh, uh, groups and the like, that now the internet facilitates that kind of radicalization, that kind of uh, isolation. Uh, and so that also, uh, to the extent that that draws us apart, that also, uh, I think, threatens democracy. The last two points, and, and one of which is, is really the, the theme of this, uh, this session. The first is about monopoly. I mentioned before how Google and Facebook are, are essentially the, the ways that we deal with the volume of communication that we have today. Um, Google and Facebook 
have greater power over the information ecosystem worldwide than any institution since the pre-Reformation Catholic Church. Uh, and so these institutions now are in a position, as I said before, to write the rules of political communication in ways that are not subject uh, to democratic accountability. That is related to the sovereignty problem, which is what we're, we're, we're focusing on today. Because, and, and I'll give you an example uh, from uh, Nick Clegg, who you probably know, uh, head of public policy at Facebook. About six years ago, or uh, four or five years ago, when you had the European parliamentary elections, Nick Clegg came to Europe and, and announced what would be the rules for political advertising in the European parliamentary elections. Now just think about that for a second from the standpoint of digital sovereignty, right? Which is that you have an official from an American company coming to Europe in order to announce what the rules are going to be for political advertising. And not only does, it, does the sovereignty problem uh, exist when, it when you start thinking about American companies and their influence around the world, and as we know, you know, in the US we have a very different free speech tradition than most other uh, countries in the world, but also it's, a, it's the undermining of the sovereignty which gives us our election manipulation problem. Right, so the 2016 election, the role that Russians played in, um, uh, in, in, uh, in the U.S. election, as well as the way that other uh, authoritarian governments and, and, and fr frankly, any, any government can now have the ability to mess with a, an election in a foreign country. And, and that problem, while it's, look, the United States has had a long history of, of going into other countries' elections, other countries, that, that, that is not new. But the ease with which someone, you know, the, the kind of stereotypical 300 pound guy in his ba mother's basement uh, in a foreign country who can then go in and put up stuff for a, um, uh, that would affect the outcome of an election. Or to take a real example in the US, the fact that these Macedonian teenagers, many of you may have heard of this story, group of Macedonian teenagers who put up uh, pro-Trump uh, websites not because they were particularly pro-Trump, but they realized it was favored in the Google and Facebook advertising models, right? So that, again, to focus on the technology itself and how it undermines um, uh, democracy. And so if a democracy means the ability to at least control the political system or the, the, the election system in order to wall yourself off, to, to sort of favor your own citizens, that is undermined uh, by, this, by this new technology. And so, um, as I said, there is another model, which is to say all of what I said was true, but it's not unique to democracies. The internet is essentially free, right? It's, it's, it's about threatening power and that it's going to undermine all kinds of government equally. That's a, that's a viable possibility. Um, and that, yes, it's going to empower dissidents as well as trolls. It'll empower muckrakers, right? let's say journalists that are finding government corruption as well as people who dox other people. It'll empower freedom fi fighters as well as mobs, right? So there's a kind of anarchy that is favored by the internet. That's a possibility. That was, I think, after 2016, something that you, that you might have thought. However, I think that actually, and this obviously, there's a lot of text on this slide, but this is, this is the key part of the argument, that there are certain features of the internet that actually facilitate authoritarian rule. And I don't think we've spent enough time outside, I should say, uh, uh, the halls of Science Po, where you have uh, uh, spent quite a bit of time on it. Um, we, we haven't spent enough time thinking about what it is about the technology itself that actually enables authoritarians to do things that they couldn't do in the pre-internet age. Now, of course, there has always been censorship. There has always been propaganda. There has always been surveillance. But it's the new technology that ends up facilitating a different degree of authoritarian control than existed in the pre-internet age. All right, so now let me walk through why I think that is. So in, when, we, when I talk about censorship, it's not just about you know, taking down an individual post online, right? It's about using the totality of human experience that exists online to then feed into a structure of punishment for speech uh, that, that exists in society. So whether it's takedowns of accounts, whether it's takedowns of posts, uh, shutting down the internet itself, or punishment and even murder of people for what they do online, that is a capacity that authoritarian governments have, 
Whereas previously, if you were having a conversation with a group of people in your immediate environment, you were not, you might be free from uh, the kind of surveillance and uh, punishment that the state would uh, inflict. Secondly, when it comes to propaganda, um, the degree to which you have state-controlled media that will uh, be able to flood the zone with certain narratives becomes quite important. I was talking to some folks actually here in Paris who work for, for one of the major platforms where he was saying, you know, it's, it's not just, um, wait, did something happen there? This is where I am. Yep, yep. It, it's, it's not just the, um, the fact that you have typical propaganda in the you know, classic sense. Um, it's that you also have the ability of, of authoritarian governments to, as, we, you know, as Steve Bannon say, flood the zone with stuff, though he used a different word, right? That you can totally, uh, you can manipulate dissident opinion by uh, in sort of invading those spaces in order to change the speech. And one thing that hasn't got enough uh, attention is um, the way that the Chinese, we, we, when we think about the Chinese uh, control of the internet, it's not limited. You, you think about censorship and that kind of classic authoritarian control, but the way that they use what's known as the 50 cent army, a whole, gr a whole group of people who are involved in surveilling the internet and who then engage in speech to distract and to dilute uh, certain other speakers, right? So if you have a, 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 a group that is talking about Tiananmen Square or talking about what's happening, say, uh, with respect to the COVID lockdowns, this army of people is then able uh, to, to, to co-opt and to engage in cheerleading, cheerleading and to distract and, and sort of pollute those environments in order to shift the discussion. Again, something that would not be as, as capable uh, in the real world. Um, also, I want to make you know, maybe a, a provocative argument here, which is to say that authoritarian governments are also, fav in their capacity to engage in hypocrisy and lying, that they are favored in uh, the internet age. Because the degree to which you can say things without being accountable for them. Now, of course, I, speaking of my own country, right, we have plenty of lying and hypocrisy in, in democratic systems as well. I'm not, but the ability, if you are a, a regime that is interested in obfuscation and lying and hypocrisy, um, you will not be held accountable in the same way that you would uh, in another environment. Finally, talking about uh, surveillance. Monitoring um, you know, the, it sort of is an obvious point. But the, in the cell phone age, the ability to monitor pretty much every aspect of our lives um, uh, gives authoritarians an advantage that those in other countries that value privacy um, uh, and, and other freedoms are not, are not given. And so in particular, if you look at the, what I call the watershed event of COVID, which actually gave not just in authoritarian governments, but, the, but it sort of surveillance became... Uh, popular around the world as a result of uh, dealing with the pandemic, um, that now that has taken surveillance to yet a new level uh, in these authoritarian regimes. And that when you combine the data collection due to surveillance with the new capacities that artificial intelligence provides you, authoritarian governments actually have an advantage because they can gather all of the information of their uh, citizens in ways that if a democracy did, there, there might be some blowback. And so, again, the, the point that I, that I want to drive home is what is it about the technology itself that favors certain types of governments as opposed to others? However, and this is, this is I don't know, maybe that was the bad part of the story, maybe this is the good part of the story, at least this is the complicated part of the story. Not all authoritarians are created equal. And as I was saying before, the Chinese model is the outlier model. It is a particular model where um, the walled garden that China has is pretty much unlike any other country in the world. Different countries will have you know, uh, gardens that are more or less impenetrable, walls that are higher or lower. But what the Chinese have done because of the particular time and place in which they imposed it um, has facilitated a surveillance state that is not as uh, uh, not as replicable elsewhere. 
Um, and in part, that is also because, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this, this more in a second, is the availability of homegrown substitutes for the kinds of economic apps and models uh, that, that are prevalent in the West and also prevalent in some other authoritarian regimes. Um, and the sheer state capacity that the Chinese have in order to engage into, in those uh, uh, phenomena and those features that I mentioned earlier. All others have some dependence on Western technology, some exposure to these media, less capacity to engage in total surveillance. And so as we think about what factors will affect um, and determine authoritarian digital capacity, this is not an exhaustive list, but ones that I think are worth, worth thinking about. The first is, what is the relationship of these platforms, uh, of these governments to Western platforms? And it, it's actually quite interesting. If you think about, like, let's take, uh, and, and Sergey is obviously the, one of the world experts on this, think about how the Russians were able to deal with YouTube on the one hand or Facebook on the other. They were much better able to shut down Facebook. When I say able to, they could shut down anything, but they didn't shut down YouTube. And why wouldn't they shut down YouTube? You think it's, it, it poses a threat to them, and they certainly closed down some accounts in the way they went after Navalny. There's a whole story there. But they can't shut down YouTube entirely because the state itself and the economy depend, and the media system actually depends on YouTube. And so there's a complex negotiation that always goes on between the platforms and some of these authoritarian governments. Um, but had they had their own YouTube, right, that was, that was prevalent enough that it could be a substitute, which is effectively what happens in China, that that would be a very different reality uh, than what we have today. Second is to what degree, uh, under this point of uh, the relationship of Western platforms, to what extent do the Western platforms have personnel or what we call a throat to choke inside uh, these authoritarian regimes. And so uh, basically the Western platforms, have, the US platforms have taken themselves out of, of Russia um, in order to, and, and, and there's still the, the risk of families and, and it, I can tell you really interesting and depressing stories about uh, these decisions that had to be made in the middle of the night in Silicon Valley on how to protect uh, these workers. But in different parts of the world, as you probably know, there are now laws, this is true in West, some Western democracies as well, of that the platforms have to have someone there who can then get put in jail uh, in the event that the, uh, the, that the, the government wants to uh, punish the platform, right? And so, the, so take something like Sing a country like Singapore, again, not, I don't want to even suggest that they're on the, on the scale as, um, some of these more authoritarian governments, but the platforms can't afford to leave Singapore. They have huge uh, facilities there, or it would be very, very expensive for them to do so. Um, whereas another, and, and the same is true, of course, with India, um, and, and that sort of is quite important as you think about the importance of the market uh, to the platform. So no matter what content moderation rule the Indian government comes up with, it's gonna be very difficult for any of the major platforms uh, to leave. Um, but if you were a smaller country, a smaller authoritarian government, think of many of the countries in Africa that have tried to punish the platforms and have, as a result, because they couldn't, many of them engaged in internet shutdowns. Think about uh, Ethiopia. Um, um, Nigeria did something interesting with Twitter where they sort of kicked them out and now they're back under conditions that we don't quite know about. Um, uh, but those, but the capacity of the state to punish these platforms depends on how significant that market is and how big the presence of that platform is uh, in the country and how important it is uh, right, to the economics of the firms. So secondly, and I, I already sort of discussed this a little bit with China, is state capacity. And so the Chinese simply have great capacity when it comes to regulating their population. And you see this uh, in, as I said, the 50 cent army as well as all kinds of uh, other uh, capacity that they express with respect to, say, um, state media. Um, and the avail availability of homegrown substitutes. One of the interesting questions that I do not think we have uh, a good answer for is the degree to which Chinese technology is now being used by other authoritarian governments to facilitate the same kinds of uh, surveillance, censorship, and propaganda that we see in China. 
Um, I say I don't think we have. We, we know that the, that the technology is there, and literally from Angola to Zambia, you have the the, the use of uh, Chinese technology sometimes for uh, the, the surveillance and, and 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 other things. But it's not as if the the, the Chinese social media platforms are necessarily uh, as popular. WhatsApp, as you might know, is incredibly popular in Africa. In some ways, there are literally societies and governments that run on it. Um, and so it is very difficult for, for authoritarian governments to clamp down on, on those. But the capacity of the, the particular authoritarian government to regulate different elements of the stack, the internet stack, is really a critical, I think, feature of uh, a critical question as to how successful an authoritarian government can be. And so, and I want to, let me just dwell on that just for a moment. The, the, uh, because the, Censorship abilities of an authoritarian government do depend on which parts of the stack that it's able to um, enforce its censorship regime. If it's just about kicking out Twitter or kicking out Signal, as some have done, um, that's one thing. For others, they don't have that capacity, and so they've got to take blunter instruments like these internet shutdowns, like the like control of the telecom uh, uh, facilities, right? And that has greater costs for the authoritarian government, so they're going to be less able, or, or I mean, the population will be less willing uh, to suffer under it. And so the degree to which the authoritarian government is able to intervene at different parts of the internet stack is, I think, a critical question. At, with China, they essentially own the entire stack, right? So that, that their capacity for censorship uh, extends uh, from top to bottom. Finally, is the geo geopolitical position of the given authoritarian regime, both with respect to international trade and the degree to which their reputation in terms of protecting human rights will then be met with sanctions uh, from the West. And I don't mean kind of classic economic sanctions, but just what does the reputation of a country, if it engages in this, uh, mean for uh, their geopolitical position? Let me end by just talking a little bit about the implications for foreign policy and tee up the issue of digital sovereignty. So not only do I think that authoritarian governments are uniquely advantaged by some of these technologies, but they're uniquely advantaged in their ability to project influence around the world. And that's because, as I was saying, take the, take the issue of election manipulation, that a authoritarian government that essentially can act covertly and is much able to uh, sort of uh, plausibly deny its role in, in election manipulation uh, is, I think, advantaged if it wants to have influence in other countries' politics in ways that, say, democracies aren't. Now, of course, again, there are plenty of democracies trying to destabilize authoritarian regimes uh, and, and also to, to influence elections in kind of quasi-democracies. That, of course, happens. The problem is, and we've seen this actually in the US government most recently, that tried to engage in a disinformation campaign. We, we sort of discovered this at the Stanford Internet Observatory, where it was not even a disinformation campaign, but a foreign influence operation, and it was miserably a failure. Right? Because it's just very difficult, I think, for democracies to engage uh, in the same kind of uh, propaganda without it blowing back on them. Um, secondly, the, the power of authoritarians, uh, and, and this really can't be um, overstated, particularly the Chinese in the standard setting bodies uh, for, for internet regulation is absolutely critical. And as you think about the, the question of digital sovereignty, the role that authoritarian governments uh, are able to play in crafting the rules of digital communication and, and digital trade really, really is quite uh, important. And then finally, as a way of teeing up the issue of digital sovereignty for the rest of the panel, the, the, and uh, maybe to be a little bit needlessly provocative here, which is to say that the openness of the web necessarily undermines digital sovereignty, right? That there is a sense of a zero sum game here that the more we embolden any state's control of its internet, the less able are we to criticize any given state's uh, control of its internet. And so that is not to argue that we should, you know, that there should be only be one set of rules for the internet. Of course, every country is going to have uh, it, its set of rules. But the hard part is to distinguish and to sort of advertise and promote a set of sovereignty tools that would apply essentially to the good sovereigns but then can't be manipulated and abused by the bad sovereigns. And so with that, I will say merci, or thank you, uh, and I look forward to your questions.
So, thank you so much, Nate, for such an inspiring uh, presentation. Et je pense que, avec une telle introduction en français, nous sommes obligés de uh, formuler des remerciements en français également. <laughs> Uh, but I, I she said something nice about me, but, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, but we, we have to, to, to use English for the, at least for the, the end of this panel. So, <laughs> so with no fur, further ado, I, I'm, I'm leaving the floor to Sergei Goriev. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Florence. And thank you very much, Nate, uh, for uh, being generous towards uh, my book. Uh, and indeed, uh, actually, your last slide is very similar to what we say in the last uh, chapter of the book, to the extent that I think if I asked uh, OpenAI to <laughs> write this speech uh, in the style of Sergei Gurif, who knows? Maybe we would get the same, the same the thing. Honor uh, no, 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 that's, uh, that's an honor for me. Um, so uh, I generally agree with uh, Nate's uh, argument, basic argument. Uh, what I'm going to do in my uh, 15 minutes, I will try to add uh, quantitative elements to this. Nate himself has done a lot of quantitative work. He didn't, didn't present numbers, but I'll talk about several things. One of the things, indeed, how non-democracies work today. The other thing, I will talk about a recent paper we published on how broadband, mobile broadband internet has changed politics around the world. And finally, I will talk about uh, um, some case studies, including China, China and Russia. And uh, I will try to be more optimistic than Nate, but I will give you also some very, very pessimistic uh, and gloomy messages. So on dictatorships, um, this book, Spin Dictators, is indeed a, a book for a general audience, but it's based on uh, uh, several quantitative studies we wrote together with Daniel Triesman, who is a political scientist at UCLA. And basically, our main argument is that dictatorships are not what they used to be. In 20th century, a normal dictator is somebody who wears military or paramilitary uniform, whether you're a true general or you're a soldier who has grown up to wear something which looks military, because you want to project force, you want to project uh, uh, terror, you usually use something like an ideology. Sometimes people say Viktor Orban has an ideology relative to Nazism or Bolshevism. Modern autocrats don't have ideology. Um, and basically the idea is to use mass repression to terrorize the population into submission. Terrorize openly. Use censorship openly. Uh, write censorship in your constitution. Write single party system in your constitution. A lot of people would say Soviet constitution was a constitution of a free state. Yes, but uh, there was an article six which said communist party is the ruling party. Uh, this is not how dictatorships work today. Dictators wear business suits, go to Davos, uh, talk to business people, uh, invite foreign capital, that's very important. Uh, because they want to benefit from uh, globalization, benefit from foreign technology, uh, uh, benefit uh, from ability to trade and invest and store their wealth outside. And in that sense, uh, these dictatorships now are pretending to be democracies. They say, maybe we are imperfect democracies, but nonetheless democracies. In our book, we argue that we have to be very clear that these are not democracies. Democracies are political regimes uh, which... Uh, choose leaders and policies through sufficiently fair, free and fair elections. This is not what uh, those regimes do. Now, our argument is when we classify all the dictatorships today, our argument is 40 years ago, majority of dictatorships was old style 20th century fear-based dictatorships, which we call fear dictators. Today, majority of non-democratic regimes in the world are spin dictatorships. Dictators based on deception, on manipulation of information. Dictators that use uh, narratives and uh, deceive the public into submission. They say, we are Democrats, we are popular, you should believe us. But quietly, they use censorship. And this is where uh, Nate's argument is so important, that internet allows you you censorship in a deniable way. You say, you have a lot of websites, but then you, then you can figure out at some point that some of these websites are actually government websites or government-controlled websites or websites 
bought by friends of the government. There is actually a quantitative study on Viktor Orban's uh, censorship strategy, where they show how friend of Viktor Orban bought a major online media, and this online media suddenly stopped talking about Viktor Orban's corruption. Uh, so that's a typical, typical uh, thing. This, uh, uh, this deniable censorship and propaganda machines work in a very sophisticated way. Nate's co-author, Josh Tucker, once studied uh, Russian trolls, and he discovered that uh, uh, one third of trolls is actually anti-Putin. And that was a surprising finding, except then when we actually saw a clinical study of how troll factories work, we saw that they work in troikas, in trios. So uh, these people come uh, in, to work in, in teams of three, and they go, they start with Vladivostok, a uh, time zone in the east, so in the morning in Moscow, Vladivostok's already waking, w w waking up, so one of them says, Putin is the greatest guy ever. The second guy says, Putin is the worst guy ever. And the third guy says, you're both wrong, the truth is in the middle, Putin is a good guy. Not the great guy, but a good guy. And so you have this, you have this debate. Uh, it looks like a free debate, but then you finally uh, figure out that, uh, well, Putin is a good guy. And so this is a typical spin dictator's uh, technology, which is, of course, reinforced by the ability to use digital media because it creates this feeling of plural pluralism, a real debate. The, we talk in the book a lot about how you also function with uh, manipulated elections, uh, quasi-multi-party systems, and stuff like that. But of course, information technology is the core of, of modern spin dictatorships. Now, uh, we shouldn't end with these regimes, because uh, eventually these regimes face very difficult choices. If you want to benefit from modern economic models, eventually you need to rely on educated class. And educated class, as we show with data, is becoming increasingly critical of those regimes. In a democratic country, people with more education are actually more positive towards their governments. In non-democratic countries, it's vice versa. People are paid better, educated people are paid better, their quality of life is higher, but they're more critical of the leadership because they understand that the leadership is uh, taking the country uh, in the wrong direction. And so you need to do something about this, and eventually you can either democratize by mistake or consciously divest in the regimes, and these things happen, or sometimes you go backwards to, towards the old-style uh, model, and for example, Venezuela of Chavez is a typical spin dictatorship, Venezuela of Maduro is a typical uh, fear dictatorship. And the same is uh, with, uh, some people would say, Erdogan 1.0, Erdogan 2.0, or Putin 1.0, and Putin 2.0. And, uh, well, Putin 6.0, whatever. <laughs> uh, but Putin, after this year, he, his initial idea was evidently to continue with the spin dictatorship. He didn't introduce censorship before the war. He wanted to replace something in 2014 and, introduce censor, and he introduced censorship only when he saw that this war is not a quick, uh, bloodless, efficient spin dictator's war. Instead, it was a, uh, clear after a few days of the war that this is not going to be compatible with the old-style spin dictatorship uh, uh, model, so he introduced brutal censorship and uh, still... Today, as uh, Nate correctly said, certain social media continue to exist. YouTube is still functioning. Telegram is still functioning. I would say for different reasons. Uh, Instagram and Facebook are banned. And interestingly, company Meta is now announced, well, not now, in the first week of the war, it was announced an uh, extremist organization like Daesh, uh, ISIS, uh, or Taliban. Interestingly, WhatsApp, which belongs to Meta, still functions, right? Um, so uh, I think, I think uh, the, reasons, uh, the reasons for why YouTube is functioning and why, uh, uh, why Telegram functioning are different. Telegram is dominated by the state. Indeed, the state invested a lot of money in producing uh, those uh, troll Telegram channels. Uh, YouTube uh, functions for a different reason. The political part of YouTube is very limited. And so if you sh uh, shut down YouTube, you will offend uh, another 90 million of users 
who will be extremely unhappy they cannot watch their um, cats or cat videos or gastronomic videos. And uh, the government shut down Instagram and saw how unpopular it was, and so they decided not to repeat this mistake. Now, let me uh, quickly talk about this paper that I mentioned, uh, which uh, was published last year in the Quarterly Journal of Economics called 3G Internet and um, uh, Confidence in Government. Uh, we argue there that in, it was the last uh, 10 years which really changed the relationship between internet and politics. Because uh, when uh, uh, Larry Diamond wrote the paper about liberation technology, we still didn't have real social media and we still didn't have the widespread mobile broadband internet. So if you go back, uh, say, to 2007 and ask yourself how many people in the world lived in areas covered by 3G or 4G internet. 4G didn't exist yet. Yeah, I see a lot of young people in the, uh, in the room, so you probably think 3G is extremely slow, and I think so as well. But in 2007, it was a breakthrough technology where you could actually send, upload, and download photos and even videos. And yet, in 2007, only 4% of global population lived in areas where you had some kind of 3G signal. That has changed in the next 10, 15 years, and we live in the world where you have uh, mobile broadband, internet, and uh, social media. So uh, we try to figure out, using the data on mobile coverage in every point in the world, and also Gallup World Polls, uh, which are polls of public opinion run in 100 plus countries. We look at subnational uh, data on government approval. We don't have data on China. Gallup is not welcome in China, to put it mildly. Uh, we don't have data, for example, in Kazakhstan. But we have a lot of data on many non democratic regimes. And we ask this question is, internet, is mobile broadband internet a uh, disinformation technology or liberation technology? And a bit in a nuanced way, how, uh, like uh, Nate has already formulated, we find both. We find support for both. On average, we find that when mobile broadband internet arrives, government popularity goes down. And then, of course, we try to look when it happens. We, we show that if government is corrupt, more people with internet learn that government is corrupt. If government is clean, well, about 10% of, of countries are clean. Uh, so if you look at the cleanest uh, 10 or 15, 14 countries in the world, when internet arrives, actually government popularity goes up. So that would be Sweden, New Zealand, Switzerland, Finland, Germany, not United States. United States is where it actually ends. Uh, but uh, basically what we show is if you don't have mobile broadband internet, the link between what actually happens in terms of corruption, what people know, is very weak. If you have mobile broadband internet, if you are corrupt, people know. And that is where internet is, mobile broadband internet is a accountability, is a accountability um, uh, mechanism. So another, uh, another thing which we find is mobile broadband internet arrives, government popularity goes down if internet is not censored, right? And many countries do that a lot. Uh, and I can talk about, uh, we've collected data on, on how much internet censorship they are, mostly pretty much downloading this data from Google website. Um, uh, but uh, uh, overall, censorship works. Uh, if traditional media are censored and uncensored internet arrives, the impact of uncensored internet is even stronger. So if internet is the only alternative, then its impact on government approval is stronger. So that is something that we also, also see. However, we also find, as uh, Nate has mentioned, that internet, mobile broadband internet, helps populists. So for example, when we look at Europe, in Europe we had unprecedented rise of populism in this century, especially in the second decade of this century. And we show that half of this increase in vote share for populists in Europe can be explained by the arrival of mobile broadband internet. And uh, this is not surprising in a sense because populists always use the latest uh, communication technology. So, uh, for the reasons that Nate has indicated, Nazi Germany, for example, uh, German Nazis relied on radio. Goebbels really, really 
invested in his ability to ma manipulate public opinion using radio. There is a paper uh, about this in the same quarterly journal of economics. Another paper is actually about Father Coughlin in the, in the US, uh, authoritarian populist a priest uh, who, uh, who, who used uh, radio in the United States. Uh, you can also think about right-wing cable TV in the US in the uh, late 20th century. But the very first populist, um, uh, William Jennings Bryan, has also, it's probably, we can uh, talk to, about him as a good populist, but he was still the first populist, the presidential candidate of 1896. He used modern communication, new communication technology of railroads and telegraph for his presidential campaign. And uh, the reason for that is, if Donald Trump wants to use mainstream media, CNN, New York Times, he can't, because that's where um, uh, gatekeepers are. He needs to circumvent the uh, existing technology and reach out to the public directly, which he does. Now, uh, that is something that uh, we observe in all, uh, in all countries, in all times, and we see that uh, internet is especially important here because first, especially mobile broadband internet and social networks are especially good for populists because barriers to entry are very low. Uh, printing press in uh, times of Martin Luther King was expensive. Radio is expensive, TV is expensive. Websites are less expensive. And for Donald Trump, it's actually free. Uh, and uh, the other thing is social media uh, offer this uh, feeling of uh, feedback and ownership. People talk back to you, to you, a populist leader, so we shouldn't be surprised there. So uh, my, my time is up. Let me, let me just say that in this paper, referees also asked us to look at three case studies, and I would like to offer you these three case studies, and then I'll talk briefly about China. So the three case studies we look at is Facebook president, uh, WhatsApp president, and Alexei Navalny. So when we talk about Facebook president, we talk about liberation technology. You know, Romania is a, is a parliamentary republic where president is not a very important person, yet president is directly elected. And in Romania, you had a corrupt government. Romania is uh, one of the most corrupt, well, it's actually officially the most corrupt country in Europe. And uh, there was an anti-corruption president who won this campaign on Facebook. He was the first European leader who had a one million followers on Facebook. And he stayed president, he's still president, he played a very important role for making sure the corrupt government goes to jail. And uh, that was a very, very difficult battle for many years. Uh, What's up, president, is a different story. It's a, it's a story of uh, Jair Bolsonaro who won his 2018 uh, election on WhatsApp. And I can talk more about this. We talked yesterday about this, how WhatsApp in Brazil in 2018 was very conducive to dissemination of uh, false information, fakes about his opponents. Now, in that particular case, I should say that his opponents were corrupt. So there was also true information about their corruption that uh, Bolsonaro disseminated. He didn't disseminate information, information about his own family's corruption, but that's a different story. Uh, and then Alexei Navalny, and this is, I think is, a, we, we, put a, we discussed a, the a film about Prime Minister Medvedev, uh, 2017 film, which showed how even in this spin dictatorship, the space for internet allows you to criticize uh, corruption, and we show how popularity of Dmitry Medvedev was destroyed by one single video which of course was not shown on TV, but it was actually viewed 40 million times in a country of 140 million and completely destroyed uh, approval of Medvedev and his uh, subsequent uh, political career. So this is a liberation technology or accountability technology. Now to end on a pessimistic note, I fully agree with what uh, Nate has said about China. So I mentioned that spin dictators are uh, more numerous than uh, fear dictators. Some fear dictators remain, Syria, North Korea, but China is its own category. So China doesn't kill a lot of people, but China is a clear fear dictatorship. It's very clear that uh, Chinese leadership is based on force. And you see forced confessions of dissidents on TV. You see what's happening in certain regions of China. And uh, yet, uh, what China uses is exactly the tools that Nate has described. Does that very effectively. They don't need to put a lot of people in jail because uh, they manage to prevent protests through, in particular, AI, artificial intelligence technology. And there are a few papers by Martin Biraja, David Yang, and uh, Noam Yuchtman 
who study this interaction between Chinese government and private companies which produce AI. And this is something that uh, is really scary. So basically, these companies are for-profit companies. They need uh, to train their algorithm to sell to supermarkets or to, to industry. For that, they need data to train their algorithm on. And this data they get through procurement contracts with police departments, which give them the contracts, give them the data, no privacy rules, so Chinese government amasses a lot of data, gives them no, no research ethics committee. I'm in Science Po, I'm also presiding over research ethics committee, so we think about personal and privacy issues when we do research. Chinese AI companies don't. So their, their algorithms are much better trained because data are more, uh, uh, more sizable. And then, of course, AI companies help Chinese government to suppress protests. And so there is uh, research which shows that if you have a local protest, police department procures more AI services and the protests go down. And then these AI companies, after procurement contracts, become more profitable because their, uh, their algorithm becomes uh, algorithm become better. And this is actually something which should scare us because this symbiosis may give Chinese AI companies an edge over Western competitors. So this is what really, really scares me, for example. And I think you should be scared as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sergei. And I'm now leaving the floor to Arancha Gonzalez. Thank you. Uh, let me start with narratives. Uh, the narrative that uh, Nathan and Sergey used uh, is the one of uh, the liberating power of technology. I want to start with another narrative um, in a field I feel a bit more comfortable with, uh, which is international trade. The idea that China entering the World Trade Organization will lead to a democratic China. It's another narrative that was peddled at the time, maybe to ensure they would, there would be political support for China's accession to the World Trade Organization, not sure how serious we were or how much we believed at the time that this would be the result, but this is how we framed the conversation, and these conversations are coming back to haunt us. So I want to talk about techno-nationalism. I want to tell you about uh, this vision that is now the prevailing vision in many parts of the world, whereby uh, your prosperity and your um, security will depend on you gaining dominance or at least being self-reliant on technology. And that the race of technology by others would be a threat uh, to you. A threat to your security and a threat to your prosperity. I want to unpack a little bit this. It's a different uh, dimension. It's a complementary. It builds on um, uh, Nate's um, geopolitical uh, slash economic uh, intersection. And I want in particular to look at what the, look, the world looks like, not for China or for the US, which are the main protagonists in this battle, but what happens with the rest of the world. So let me unpack this for you. Let me start uh, with uh, China. China has decided uh, a while ago to invest heavily on its own technological development. It's a mix of, and we can't figure out what percentage of it's in the mix, uh, between uh, development, not falling into the middle income trap that many countries fall into. They've done the first stages, they've moved uh, farmers to industry, industry now kind of to services and the next stage is incorporating technology in its development. But there is also very clearly, um, or at least this is what we presume in the rest of the world, that there is a desire from China to also use technology to gain power and through that to reshape the international order. Now, how is China doing this? First, massive investments. Massive investments in the order of $1.5 trillion between 2020 and 2025 in uh, artificial intelligence, in the development of 5G, in the Internet of Things. Um, second, so massive public investments. Second, a comprehensive plan is called Made in China. Now you will tell me 
We've heard about made in the U.S., uh, make it in China, make it in India was another very popular. But in China, there is a comprehensive plan and the ability to, in an articulated manner, push it through. The third ingredient, uh, Nate uh, uh, alluded to that, is uh, gaining uh, a space in the uh, standard discussions on the international standards field. It's in the... Uh, ITU, it's also in private standard setting organizations. Now you will tell me, this is not unlike what the EU or the US did in the past. If you take the automobile sector, the standards were defined uh, by the EU uh, in the UN Economic Commission for Europe, for example. So China has learned the ropes and it's now doing this also pretty successfully in international standard setting organizations. Fourth element is this idea of a dual circulation model, uh, pushing a lot of technology domestically, uh, but keeping the opening uh, to international markets uh, as a source of uh, growth and development for China. Uh, fifth ingredient, universities, changing massively the curricula in universities to build the next generation of brains in the country. And all of this, obviously, uh, with uh, uh, well-known uh, uh, protectionist domestic policies uh, of uh, China, for example, in 2019, ordering its public institutions, public government, government agencies to uh, shop technology only, so hardware and software only made in China. Now, how far has China gotten? Total research and development spending still well below the US venture capital still well below uh, the US, um, capacity to innovate uh, in particular in general purpose technologies still below the US, um, and a fair amount of uh, issues around intellectual property rights and the manner in which uh, businesses in China appropriate uh, intellectual property rights of others. But let's say that China is moving fast, probably faster than not only what the US anticipated, but also what China foresaw at the time when it launched uh, these initiatives. Let me look now at the other side, the United States. The US started from the vision that uh, what mattered was relative advantage over China. But now it's moved from relative advantage to clearly wanting to maintain a lead as big a lead as possible uh, in advanced technology. So what has uh, the US been doing? Uh, certainly was doing a fair amount of discouraging others, as well as the US uh, in using Huawei uh, uh, deployment uh, of uh, 5G technology. And uh, many of us uh, have been uh, having to deal with this. Um, Two very recent pieces on the U.S. side, the uh, July 2022, so this year, uh, the July Chips Act, a massive uh, investment on the U.S. Uh, for uh, chip manufacturing um, to the tune of $52 billion of public support for chip uh, uh, semiconductor uh, production uh, in the U.S. and uh, $4.2 billion U.S. dollars uh, to innovate in the technologies, uh, especially nanotechnologies, to produce uh, the smallest the scale possible of semiconductors with the largest uh, transmission capacity. This piece is complemented in October this year with uh, the uh, raft of export control measures adopted by the US to limit, first to limit the transfer of graphic processing uh, units outside the US. The only one that has it today is Taiwan, on license from the US. So uh, a mechanism to prevent this technology from leaking out of the uh, US to China, either directly or through Taiwan, as well as very severe uh, limitations on um, companies in the US to provide technological services to Chinese uh, companies, services. So we're talking about people not being able to provide those services uh, to the US. Now, if this is the landscape uh, for uh, China and the US, 
what are what where does this lead and where does this leave the rest of the world so it leads uh, uh, basically to a bifurcation uh, first it leads uh, to a fracturing of the uh, technology uh, space i am not uh, in describing this judging if it's good or if it's bad I'm just describing where we are heading, uh, and then uh, probably uh, we can discuss uh, what can we do about this, uh, and what part is good and what part is bad. But for now, what we see is to reduce uh, uh, re this desire to reduce interdependencies, this desire uh, to control uh, technology has an impact uh, in terms of uh, hindering uh, diversification strategies, disruption of uh, international value chains, inflationary pressures. I mean, all of this is what we are seeing already. Um, difficulties, uh, or rather, um, moving companies uh, and governments to build much more on the resilience uh, side. Um, and uh, concerns about uh, increasing the concentration of risks. The second uh, direction this is heading uh, is reducing the, the incentives for scientific cooperation. Now, if I look at the last time uh, we faced uh, something similar, which was the Cold War, uh, there was uh, a safer space for scientists to continue to talk. The direction that this is heading is essentially uh, preventing uh, the scientific community uh, from working uh, with each other. The second uh, is um, uh, basically the disruption of this one stack this one uh, technology stack that goes from uh, basic science to applied science uh, to technology to goods and services, this one basic stack, fragmenting it uh, with uh, um, obviously consequences for how we build our systems uh, globally uh, to uh, uh, produce a, a little bit more uh, global stability and peace. So I wanted, uh, I end here, uh, we have... Uh, spoken a lot and it would be probably good to uh, give you a bit of time uh, to comment but I wanted to bring this other perspective that is in a way complementary to what we're seeing in how technology is used uh, in democracies or in autocracies to manipulate uh, uh, the public debate, the public discourse, the public space, the political space and look a little bit more at the uh, economic space because this is also what's happening mm -hmm. And it's not without consequences. Back to you. So thank you so much for such uh, an inspiring presentation. So we have a few minutes to take questions. Um, I think we have a mic. Yes. So my view, that's a good question. Uh, my view is that, look, something like what I just showed you, the chatbot with GPT-3, that, that's going to be, I mean, that's available to you right now, actually, right? And, and so you, you can sort of think of um, the use of artificial intelligence in, in, in these ways as having different types of applications 
which are a greater or lesser threat to sovereignty or the economy of, of another country, right? So that, um, I mean, it's something like, take something like Google search. Now, if we, we can have a debate about, well, can, you know, the power of Google that is, has a kind of undermining effect in other countries where, where you don't essentially have your own domestic search um, system. Um, and that's what I see kind of happening here. But I actually think that the technology that's being developed and opening up, you're going to have uh, a lot of firms that are going to be uh, coming into this space. Um, uh, it is mind-blowing, I have to say, what, what, what we've seen in the last week with, with this tool. Um, uh, my son started looking at it. And, and well, for certain to think about, uh, for those of you who are coders here, put in your put in computer code and it'll it'll detect the, the problems and, you know, immediately. Or it'll give you recommendations on how to rewrite it. Or my son said, write me a poem about Oreo cookies. And they came back with it. And so it really is quite amazing. But all of those applications, I think, we'll, we'll, we'll see how this gets monetized, right? It's, right now it's free, but then we'll all get addicted to it, and then it'll be charged to us, right? Um, and so I think that, you know, as with a lot of this technological development, I think that, the, that uh, the world will reap the benefits, but that the innovators are going to end up having, um, uh, you know, advantage depending on what country they're from. One thing I just want to say on, on this and on AI, uh, I, I, I neglected to mention I had on the first slide, Mason's son is, is also, who's a postdoc at, at uh, Stanford, and who's worked with me on the digital <coughs> barriers and stuff, who's written a really interesting uh, dissertations on China. Uh, so this is, this is joint work with her that we're, that we're working on. One of the things that she finds in her work is how critical the timing of the development of these domestic technologies was for, for China. Right? We, we almost think of the Chinese internet and walled garden and its success as kind of inevitable, but they were incredibly lucky in the way that they developed, they, when they blocked off uh, foreign technology and the development uh, of these substitutes. And so now to bring your question kind of into that, it's the, the question is, well, well you know, um, how long is it going to take right, to develop uh, competitors to what we're seeing in the AI uh, marketplace in the US and what kind of governments are going to, to develop it? And as Sergey said, um, the authoritarian government, when it comes to AI uh, and its multiple uses, China is, has an incredible advantage over um, you know, the rest of the world that cannot essentially harvest that share, that amount of data from the domestic population. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes. Hello. Uh, first of all, thanks you for thanks for being here and for the great uh, speeches. And uh, um, I wanted to go back on the China situation, and because an argument was made before about like how owning the full stack gives them an advantage in counter moderation, censorship capacity. But I was reading this comment about how it arguably it is still not unlimited. In the sense that, like, for example, what we've seen in the past week, um, at some point, this guy was saying, you, there's so much content that you, like, you run into a human capital limit on the censor side. And then also uh, about how, you know, the, the, the solution, the ultimate solution for content moderation is always said to be AI. For example, by Meta, they always say, oh, AI is going to figure this out in two years. And uh, what is your opinion on the censorship capacity of China? Is it unlimited? Is there such a thing as unlimited capacity or functionally unlimited? Because maybe, you know, it's not necessary for it to be unlimited, just enough. And are we there? Are we going to ever get there? Just it. So, I mean, one of the sort of images from the last month in China, right, is Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, yes. because you have can, people can you, online. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. yeah. So one of the images from the last month in China is people standing there with white sheets of paper. I don't know. If I, I assume this is. Um, I can't hear you. I'll speak as loud as any microphone. <laughs> um, and so, uh, right. So how does this? How does an authoritarian censorship regime deal with essentially non-speech? Right. The uh, and. Uh, the answer is they figured out a way, right? And so, so like that, that's going for images of people holding up blank sheets of paper. That's a very e easy AI kind of thing to deal with. But, but you're right. 
that the more, uh, the, sort of more clever and the more ubiquitous certain types of protests are, the more likely, you know, the, the more difficult it is uh, for China to do that. And that's sort of true in the fear dictatorships generally, right? Yes, if you have two thirds of the population that really is willing to rise up, then it doesn't make a difference whether we're talking about the digital sphere or we're talking about uh, the non-digital sphere that, yeah, that, that, that um, an authoritarian government is going to have a problem. I continue to think, though, that on, on the censorship side, that they actually have the capacity to dampen most discussion on a lot of this through all, because when, when you compare it to Facebook, right, Facebook pays a price for false positives, right? When it over-senses, for example, if it ends up uh, going after terrorist content, but then it, ha it over-censors Muslim speaking content, which happened. Or if it goes after hate speech and then it ends up getting uh, uh, content from one political party, right? That, that's a price that it ends up paying that it get, it's held accountable for. China's government, not so much, right? It, I mean, it depends what we're talking about. And this is, this is um, Sergey's point about Instagram, say, in, in Russia, which is that if you end up taking down enough content, it might, it might uh, ruin the entertainment complex or, or other kinds of uh, media. But that, that, so I, I think the jury is still out. The one thing that I want to emphasize, and this, this builds on the spin dictator's argument, but also the um, work of Jennifer Pan, who's at, at Stanford, really some of the best work on the Chinese internet she, uh, she has done, is not just looking at censorship, but looking at the influence that the 50 Cent Army has in shifting discussion online. Now, maybe that's the story right now, is that th th that you're seeing limited capacity because the COVID lockdowns have hurt so many people, and, and, and it's sort of, sort of such a popular consciousness that it is much more difficult for the government to shift conversation and distract from it uh, in ways that they might have been able to do with other kinds of topics. This, uh, yes, uh, this book uh, by Jennifer Pan is called Censored, and that's the whole book about Chinese censorship, basically. So I highly recommend that. I would like to add another uh, argument here. Censorship is not the only tool. Dictators can also use targeted repression. In spin dictatorships, targeted, uh, small-scale, deniable repression. In big uh, fear dictatorships, mass repression. And so basically, if I miss your, if I don't censor you, and I see that you're effective, what I can do with you, I can kill you or put you in jail. And this is what happened to Navalny. Navalny's become too effective. His films, his videos started to reach out to more people than national TV. So he was poisoned and then put in jail. And some other people also were, were handled in this very same way. So it's not just censorship. If censorship fails, uh, dictators use other tools. And again, uh, Navalny, when Navalny was poisoned, Putin, Putin to this day says, I don't know what happened to Navalny. Uh, in China, they can take credit. Uh, they can say, yes, we killed this person. Uh, or we put this person in jail because he's an extremist or Muslim terrorist or whatever. Yeah. But, uh, so censorship may fail, but governments think about this uh, very carefully. No, I, I was, I was, uh, as I was listening to this, I'm thinking of uh, how this takes shape in our democracies also. How this takes shape with populist movements. I mean, I've been observing a little, a little bit of the populist movements in a few countries uh, in Europe, including my own. Um, and this idea that uh, you use uh, the scale, the track and trace, uh, and uh, the e ability to intrude to shift the debate where you want the debate to be shifted, um, that uh, you are, um, uh, you know, in a way guiding uh, a public uh, debate, a political debate in a direction you want uh, to drive it uh, and distract it from uh, where it is, or it should be. I mean, this is, so we've got, I would say we've got a problem and then we've got a scale of a problem and then we've got the augmented problem uh, in places where there are no checks and balances for this. But I do think we have, I see this more and more, I see this in technology, I see this in synthetic biology, that we need some rules of the game, some guardrails uh, that are built uh, on, on the technologies themselves. Because by the time we get to the use of the technologies, we are already, uh, we've already done uh, a lot of damage in our democracies, and again, uh, if uh, you can 
expanded uh, uh, exponentially uh, in, uh, in autocracies. One last question. Okay. Uh, my question is about uh, the challenges to democratic decision making in standard standard development organizations. So, as you mentioned, China has a pretty robust strategy of participation in international SDOs. Uh, the EU, in my opinion, is actually not that far behind with the Harmonized Standards Directive and how that plays a very strong role in the AI Act, that is the current draft. Uh, the US, I think uh, they will catch up to it, <laughs> to a more centric uh, governance, uh, influence over that in the years to come. Uh, but I think there are two dimensions to this sort of, not new, but newly relevant sphere of, of policy discussion, which is first, uh, um, SDOs, they exist on several levels. They're local, they're regional, and they're international. Um, and that, that doesn't really reflect what we're used to in domestic policy making. Like, I think there are different challenges to transparency due to this dynamic. And second, um, we are translating normative policy into technical design. So I would like thinking of this, considering these two dimensions, uh, what are the challenges to, to a transparent and democratic decision making this sphere and possible uh, solutions to explore? Yeah. No, I mean, I would say, I would add to this, uh, that in this uh, regulatory sphere, uh, it's not just public, there is also the private regulatory sphere because a big part of the uh, regulatory space uh, is, and the regulatory production is done at the level of a private, uh, not at the public. So, I mean, I think uh, there's been, a, I think there's been a bit of a realization. Uh, first, the game was a bit underwater. Uh, there's been a bit of a realization that uh, we needed to bring a little bit more transparency, and some countries have started to worry, for example, about the leadership in those organizations, in those standard setting organizations. They've started paying attention. In the past, they were obscure, hidden, um, operating in the dark, uh, until they realized that they were being the, the leaders that were being chosen, may, maybe they had to pay a little bit more attention. No offense to uh, who was there. Uh, so leadership is one uh, that uh, matters. Processes. Processes matter. So how do you get from the input to the output and what checks and balances exist uh, in those processes? And then simply putting a little bit more of a public spotlight on what's happening. We don't know. We know, we know when it's a very politically charged issue. You, you only know, we only uh, knew about uh, GMOs when it became a, a hugely politicized uh, issue about uh, consumer choices. Uh, but uh, there are thousands of GMO-like uh, decisions that are take place in a standard setting organizations on food safety, for example. So these are three uh, processes, leadership, and uh, building this uh, as part of the uh, uh, narrative uh, uh, internationally. Uh, this dimension is also an important dimension. Well, I'll, I'll just add one thing on that, but, but, but amplifying that, which is that you can, so, and, and, and maybe I'm just repeating this, but, but I think about, so there's the, the question whether the standards that are being set themselves are favorable to authoritarianism, favorable to democracy. That's one set of questions. The other is, are they favorable to certain countries that happen to be authoritarian, right? Th th those are actually two different questions, right? Is it something about the standards that you are setting that allow for surveillance or allow for the, the kinds of things that, that we're talking about? That I actually think is less, I mean, there's some of that, right? But a lot of it is about the, it's, it's great power dynamics as to who is going to have the power to set the, the technological standards for the future and then whose technology then gets advantaged by them. Okay, so I, I think it's time to um, close this session. So I would like to um, thank our speakers. 
je tiens à remercier une fois de plus Nate Persili. Um, thank you very much to Sergei Goriev. Thank you very much to Arancha Gonzalez for their participation. And so we will be meeting at 3 p.m. in this in this same room. So the, the, this panel will be in French. Um, and enfin, <laughs> and then we, we will have another panel on China in English. So see you at 3 p.m. Thank you.